great to be here. Thank you all for coming out. Um, you know, particularly when there's there's a, a talk involving cocktails in a few days, and you decided to, to come to this one. Of course, there's a lot of a lot of great things here tonight as well. And I want to thank the people of Rego for inviting me. This is um, just a great venue and uh, just a, a, an enormous amount of offerings here to uh, to feast on with the eyes. Um, Judith and Garrison Lieber, both 96 this year, in their 71st year of marriage. And, um, you know, they've, they've both been incredible creative forces in their own respective rights, and in, in their own mediums, in their own artistic pursuits. But there is also something really interesting to kind of look at the two of them side by side and how much they both have evolved both personally and also how that evolution has informed and nurtured um, both of, of their uh, areas that they, that they both are uh, commanding and uh, at the top of their field. The Liebers have been based in Manhattan since 1947, um, but they've had a home out on Long Island where my museum is in Stony Brook, New York. Uh, their home is actually in East Hampton, and they've been out there since 1956. So this is why we chose to do an exhibition on them. But um, I, I think, think it's, it's important, important to, to sort, sort of step, step back and, and say that, that what, what makes this project a little bit unique, unique from many others, others, and we'll talk about a few of those, is that, um, you know, we're, we're sort of looking at the two of them together, and we have sort of a combined retrospective of sorts. And I think that any time that you look at, at um, important American couples that have uh, both sort of pursued art at the highest levels, um, Stieglitz and O'Keefe, uh, Pollock and Krasner, um, Pollock and Krasner, by the way, had a house just a couple miles away from uh, the Lieber's house. Uh, you, you really start to recognize sort of the, the complex ways in which their interactions and their aesthetic choices are involved and inform one another. So, um, our exhibition actually, I, I wish I could tell you to come out and see it, it just closed. Um, it closed on Sunday, as a matter of fact. Uh, and that's sort of a very kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I open up telling you all about this and, and go right to the fact that, it, that it's no longer up. But there are a lot of other ways that you can, you can see and encounter the Libra story. And um, most significantly, you can go out actually to East Hampton. And yes, it's quite a drive uh, throughout the course of the summer. In the next few months, it's going to be difficult uh, getting out there. Um, but it is uh, there's a wonderful museum of the Lieber collection, which is open Memorial Day through Columbus Day every year. And the Liebers themselves often act as their own personal docents. They often are uh, sort of involved in meeting groups and, and talking to groups about uh, what people come out to see. Normally, they will have a gallery. Their first gallery will be dedicated to Judith's work. The back gallery is all about Garrison's continuing efforts as an artist. At 96 years old, Garrison actually painted um, 22 oils last year. And we're not talking about, um, you know, 12 by 18 small canvases. We're talking about very large 40 by 50 or even 50 by 60 canvases. So he continues to be prolifically active. Um, he will go out to his studio every morning at about 10 o'clock, usually the same time, to get things started and works uh, continuously um, uh, in, in his, in his uh, pursuits. This painting that you see in front of you um, was Antipodes, and it was, a pa it was painted in 1995. And I think it really shows, um, it shows the, the, the sort of constant influence of Cubism that uh, has been always a reference point, always um, uh, something that, that has been with him over the decades, uh, even when he's, he's kind of taken different roads as time has gone on. 
So, so the, the, the leavers are, are definitely, definitely having, having um, sort, sort of a bit, bit of a moment, moment. Uh, and it's, it's uh, you know, so we're going to kind of step back and talk a little bit about, about, about their personal history and sort of uh, get you into the story and talk both uh, about both of them together. Um, consideration of Judith Lieber's work uh, has never gone out of style and is, is continuously important kind of going on uh, going forward. Uh, well, Garrison Lieber has shown far less at galleries and museums in New York. His work is in 60 different collections and it does occasionally come out in different exhibits. Um, but in addition to our exhibition at the museum, uh, this summer if you were to go to um, uh, the Museum of Art and Design, you can see their fine exhibit, which is on the second floor at MAD uh, right through early August. Um, and earlier, actually uh, late last year, Flomenhoff Gallery down in Chelsea had a combined exhibition of Garrison and Judith Lieber, um, putting the two of them together in the same gallery. One of the logistical challenges of this story is that Garrison often paints, uh, as I had mentioned before, and also even his graphic art is on larger scale size. And so how do you take that and kind of combine it with the small, bedazzling, wonderful creations that are Judith Lieber handbags? Um, it was a, a, a consistent challenge, but also something that I think once we were able to kind of peel the layers back and think about it, uh, we were able to sort of find ways that there were commonalities in the story and also in the aesthetics that they both have that really um, kind of helped to tell that story. So let's just step back for a moment and, um, and, and talk a little bit about Judith and Garrison Lieber, their personal histories, and, um, and also kind of talk about the journey that they, that they went on. Uh, the painting at the left was actually done shortly after they had met in Budapest by a friend of theirs, uh, Peter Folds, uh, who had also studied art with Garrison in Budapest, and uh, Will Barnett, the very prominent New York artist, uh, uh, also was a mentor of Gar Garrison's and uh, taught him at the Art Students League. Um, that's, that's his painting of the, the couple uh, in uh, 2000, after more than five decades of marriage and um, their own respective careers, showing them with the tools of their trade, much as we tried to sort of do throughout this exhibition. And um, the nice thing was to have that painting and actually have um, uh, some of Garrison's paintbrushes and that exact Art Deco envelope in the case um, next to the painting. Um, but this is a story that un unfolds uh, and it, it takes us from their meeting in 1946 in war-torn Budapest. Um, Garrison was a, wrong, a, a young army radio operator. He had been uh, born in Brooklyn but actually raised in Titusville, Pennsylvania. Uh, and he, um, in 1946, after the war, was in uh, Allied-occupied Budapest, and the two of them actually met just two days after he came uh, to Budapest. Um, meanwhile, Judith grew up in an upper-class, uh, upper-middle-class um, Hungarian family in Budapest, uh, went to university uh, or went off to university in London in 1939, but was very quickly called back and experienced the war in Hungary um, over the course of, of the 1940s. Um, her family were Holocaust survivors. Um, uh, two relatives, an aunt and an uncle, were um, uh, lost at Auschwitz. 
and uh, other close family members and friends, of course, were also lost in the Holocaust. Um, her own father had a, a near miss. Uh, Judith was able actually to secure paperwork from the Swiss consulate, which um, managed to secure her father's release. Um, the family endured throughout the course of the war and uh, decided to stay in Budapest after, um, in, uh, right into 1946, when she met uh, Gerson. So the two of them had this sort of very, very different, obviously extraordinarily different background. Um, Gerson, I'll call him Gus because that's how he prefers to be often to be called, the sort of in, in a sort of personal. Um, Gus had grown up in a small town, country Pennsylvania environment. He had been a brilliantly young, talented artist in that in that community. He had experience in newspaper publishing, and then he had his war experience. But largely, it was a very circumscribed. Um, aesthetic, aesthetic experience, and though he wanted to be an artist, he had not really been able to pursue this yet. Ju meeting Judith opened up an entirely new world to him, uh, a world of, um, uh, of, of fine culture, of uh, fine uh, European art. Her parents' home was filled with uh, paintings and also with, with fine objects of art. And, and as, as uh, Gus, Gus likes, likes to say, I drank it all in, life was splendid, culture, culture art, marriage, marriage, it all happened. Um, um, he ended up taking courses at the Royal Academy of Art in Budapest, and, and they, they lived, lived for a time with her family um, as Judy tried to actually start to pick up, pick back up the trade of handbag work that she had started before the war. Um, prior to the war, she'd worked for a company called Pestle, uh, starting there as an apprentice and then mastering all aspects of the handbag trade, leather work, sewing, glue mixing, application, and also working with hand tacks. When Judith left Hungary at the beginning of 1947, um, she was the only woman in the entire country to belong to the handbag guild which um, was gradually making a gendered transformation, but um, at that point, um, she was rare and unique in that. So um, you see the two of them uh, embarking on their journey. Uh, they uh, came to America on a bride ship, uh, as you know, a lot of other American soldiers would, uh, who would meet and marry uh, wives in Europe would um, uh, take, take the ship across. They came to the U.S. in early 47. Uh, after sort of uh, bumping around Brooklyn and the Bronx and Queens for a while, they actually wound up in Manhattan, um, not too far from where they would uh, eventually settle in an apartment on 34th Street. Um, Garrison continued training in the Art Students League. Uh, he also studied art at the Brooklyn Museum of Art School and trained in graphic arts uh, with several um, very well-known uh, illustrators and artists graphic artists of the time, such as Gabor Patardi. Um, meanwhile, Judith, um, Judith eventually worked for Nettie Rosenstein. Nettie Rosenstein, famous name in fashion design, um, one of the creators of the Little Black Dress. Of course, there are you know other other claim claimer claimants of that title. Uh, she rose quickly with Rosenstein. And uh, she was the only person on staff who could really make all parts of a handbag. And that is a critical point to understand. The fact that she knew the, she knew the trade inside and out, she intuitively understood how it all came together. And it wasn't just about the sort of unique, out-of-the-box designs that she would come up with. It was also about the, a really incredible understanding of the process that led her uh, along the path to, towards uh, success in her career. Um, a lot of uh, books and um, uh, scholarly work on the, to, to the extent that there is that on this subject will indicate that the sort of the start of her rise comes about. Uh, working with Nettie Rosenstein and working with her directly on uh, the handbag for Mamie Eisenhower and Mamie Eisenhower's inauguration um, in 1953. Mamie Eisenhower had 
decided, decided to wear, wear a beautiful uh, Renoir, as it was described, pink silk gown for the evening inauguration ball in uh, January 21st, 1953. And um, Judith, to accompany this dress, uh, put together a handbag with close to a thousand rhinestones. Um, and uh, the bag has faded over time. Uh, it did. It was a, a almost direct match to the dress uh, in 1953. Uh, and this was the first in a long series of handbags that Judith would make for First Ladies. In fact, every First Lady after this, except for Rosalind Carter, and then our most recent two, Michelle Obama, Melania Trump, did not have Judith Lieber handbags, but um, every other First Lady uh, since, except for Rosalind Carter. Um, so. Uh, this was a, a, an important first step, and in the exhibition, we were able to, to uh, borrow this from the Smithsonian, uh, and it was really a kind of great moment to sort of have that, that important career highlight as uh, the beginning of, of this story for her. Um, Judith launched her own business in 1963. And uh, definitely with a lot of help from Garrison. At the beginning, the Lieber Company was very small. Um, it was located in a 300 square foot space. There were four employees. It was located in Midtown Manhattan. Um, they grossed $75,000 their first year of business. At that time, the entire handbag industry was really located within a couple of blocks around, uh, in fact, very close to their apartment uh, on 34th and, and 5th. Uh, and meanwhile, um, Garrison began to launch his art career, uh, at first really doing most of his work in, in downtown Lower Manhattan galleries, but gradually starting to make a name for himself, um, and also teaching art at the Newark School of uh, Fine and Industrial Arts in New Jersey. And so as Judy became better known, more successful, they uh, were able to begin to travel and sort of widen the scope of their world and see more and understand more as, um, as time went forward. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about Garrison and, and his art. And again, you can sort of see that, that strong um, Cubist influence. You can also, I think, you'll, you'll see through um, some of the, the works that I'm going to show you, a, a, a strong interest in infrastructure and transportation. Um, it was a very kind of uh, constant theme of his work in the 1950s and 60s, and then he re has returned to it in the last 10 years or so. Um, but uh, while we're seeing a couple of his, his oils, uh, what, and uh, I'll show you another as well, um, I think, I, think the, the, I, think I think the important point here is that cubism, for him, as, as he liked to point out, it really lended itself well to the geograph ge geographical intricacies of the built environment. So, you know, you could uh, really do interesting things with being able to, to sort of stretch the bounds of, um, of, of the, the dynamics of, of spatial relationships between power lines and roads and bridges and other infrastructure like that. Um, this was expressed in all kinds of work. Uh, you have Times Square, which he calls Nervous Square. I like Nervous Square for Times Square. Uh, 1956, an etching. Um, you see in, in Taglio Print uh, from 1965, which is an uh, aerial view, an overview of, um, uh, of Coney Island. And um, interestingly, um, this is one of more than 3,000 works, actually, that's in the Lieber collection right now. Uh, he, he liked to experiment a lot with different forms and different materials. And so you could have um, a sort of unique etching with copper plates actually built into it uh, to show you some of the East River bridges um, over uh, uh, going leading into Manhattan, Manhattan Bridge and all so uh, Brooklyn Bridge was a f uh, yeah. he had a fondness for. Um, meanwhile, uh, Garrison was helping all the while that he was was a, a, a profoundly um, 
serious and important artist that was emerging on the New York scene. He was also working hand in hand with his wife to build her business. Um, he was helping her as sort of a sounding board on design ideas. He was assisting her with getting um, works mailed off uh, and handling some of the, the shipping and receiving. Uh, but Judith began to sort of become a name by the late 1960s and early 1970s. And it really is, is by the mid-1970s that you're starting to recognize that name as a truly iconic and unique voice among the New York fashion scene. Over the years, her reputation grew as her designs increased. That number 3,500, that's her best guest estimate. That's the best guest estimate of um, the curator at the Lieber Collection. Uh, I've seen it listed as perhaps 500 more in some places, but that's that's the number that they that they put forward. Now the Lieber Couture, um, the the business that still exists that carries on the Lieber name claims to have overall 5,000 designs. Um, so that includes both the work that Judith was responsible and responsible for overseeing and also the designs that have been done since 2004 when she did her last design. Um, she was famously intolerant of inferior design and materials. As she said, quote, I hate junk. It's got to be the best. And she bridged the gap between art and functionality in her handbags. This is a really, truly important point. Her, her tendency to really see everyday objects and be inspired by everyday objects and try to take that and put it into the realm of handbags um, was really what started to make her unique. But also, she was really far-reaching in terms of, of the material that she gathered for this. Ostrich, Karung snakeskin, turbo martimus uh, seashells from the Philippines, Chinese silk ribbons. That's just a sampling of some of the exotic Lieber handbag components and embellishments. Um, so Garrison, as I said, you know, he, he was, was continuously working on his art, but also was sort of doing double duty between that and um, assisting Judith in the launching of his business. Um, as Judith once said, he helps me a lot with his brain and his artistic eye. And as he says, um, Judy was, was really always encouraging and always trying to get him to return to the studio as constantly as possible. And this is one of um, the first Lieber handbags uh, from 1964 that her company uh, was beginning to, to, um, uh, to, to market. And you'll, you'll see a sort of shift from functionality, from sort of a pure kind of traditional functionality to the Minaudiers that she began to put out, which um, definitely start to, to t take it into the realm of decorative art. Um, in 1967, she had sort of an epiphany, and this handbag, this um, Chatelaine, uh, which had come back from Italy and was uh, somewhat damaged and tarnished, she realized immediately looking at it, she just didn't know what to do with it, um, other than the thought that occurred to her, which would be to start to, to kind of work with it and work rhinestones into the decoration. And so in doing that, that combination of, of different shiny textures and surfaces began to sort of take hold of her imagination, and that's where she began to go. Um, she said that, you know, that started really a whole new trend for her, a whole new realization. Um, continuously, though, as the Minaudiers would start to come into practice, um, she also continued to, uh, uh, to work with all different types of materials. Um, uh, this is, again, a fairly early but late 1960s um, bag. This was sold at Bonwit Teller. Uh, Bonwit Teller would also invite her to come down and actually um, you could meet the designer and meet Judith Lieber and talk with her. And she did a series of these uh, de department store engagements in the late 60s and early 1970s. So, so this, this would, would be one of those first Minaudiers, um, 1968. 
and um, the resting crane was one that became very iconic. Uh, and it, she would return to this design a number of times over the years. Uh, she made one um, in an effort to sort of speak to uh, peace between Palestinians and Israelis in the early 1990s. Uh, she made one for Elizabeth Taylor, which was a, a custom-made design. Um, she did, uh, you know, probably about a dozen different variations of this one design, and that's not atypical. Um, you know, she often would return to something iconic um, maybe a decade or so later. Um, and it was really her continued balance of both that, that functionality, which she would never lose sight of. I mean, I know that she often is sort of, you're, you're, when people think of Judith Lieber handbags, they think of a certain particular kind of bag. Um, but it was, a, it was a balance of that continuous functionality and also um, style breaking molds, uh, mold breaking styles that, that led her eventually to get the prestigious Cody Award uh, and she was the first handbag designer to receive that in 1973. Um, this was helping her also to connect with uh, other famous players in the fashion world, uh, Oscar de la Renta, um, Jeffrey Bean, Ralph Lauren. She worked with all of them and many more. Um, in this particular bag, she worked with some fabric that um, she had uh, talked, uh, spoken directly with, with uh, de la Renta about one of his dress designs, and this bag was made as an accompaniment to that. Um, and that, that uh, did happen quite a bit, uh, quite frequently in the late 70s and early 1980s. Um, again, the choice of materials was extraordinarily diverse. And we had a case that just sort of looked at the, at the wide array of, of choices. Um, this bag, though, I think really also shows very nicely um, the hardware. And the hardware, uh, a lot of work went into it. Hinges, locks, other types of hardware. The gold plating was actually all done at the Lieber factory in New York, while a lot of the rest of the work on the bag was in fact done in Italy uh, by the late 1970s. And that included um, work with different types of fabrics, but also tanning of, um, of different animal skins, which began to, uh, she had, a, had a, a firm that she worked with in Italy expressly for that purpose. Um, this gives you a, a, a sort of a, a design view as well as the uh, completed Minaudier. Um, Judith often worked on her designs by hand. She used wax, clay, and cardboard, and uh, then the complex shapes began as a sculpted wax model, but uh, uh, then they would end up becoming uh, the mold that you see above for the tiger, which is actually in two parts and comes together in the middle. Um, you can, when you see a Lieber handbag, it's almost it is imperceptible to see where the soldering was done, where the connection was actually made uh, in many of these bags. Um, and then there was there was the sort of uh, the theme of inspiration. The fact that, that uh, again, anything um, was fodder for a handbag, anything that Judith could see in the world, um, in her travels, from Chinese hand warmers to a matchbox like this, which was actually from her sister's collection um, and probably came from Hungary. Those would become inspiration for bags. There is a whole range of Menadiers that have a botanical theme to them um, that, that come out of flora and fauna. And um, it, 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 also when you look at this, you have, to, you have to sort of appreciate the fact that all of those rhinestones were hand laid. And so, you know, when you have a small handbag, um, that has upwards of 7,000 to 13,000 uh, uh, Swarovski crystals on it that are all basically hand applied and they're applied um, by somebody with uh, a jeweler's tools, tweezers, basically dotting them at ad ad adhesive and putting it directly on the bag. Uh, while there were 200 people employed by the Lieber company by the early 1990s, um, 
some 100 of those 200 employees were just working on that uh, that that fine decora decorative touch of of um, applying uh, um, the stones, the, the crystals at the at the very end. Um, again, we can see from uh, the sort of botanical type themes, which she, she was, was fond of doing. There were tomatoes, there were all kinds of fruits and vegetables. You also have to remember that her husband, Gerson, was a master gardener, uh, won numerous awards in East Hampton for his gardening. Uh, he, was, he was not known as much for vegetable gardening as just doing this, this sort of wonderful backyard uh, Tuileries type uh, uh, and, and his gardens are, in fact, intact uh, to this day um, behind the Lieber House off of Old Stone Highway. Um, this is one of a shell series that she began in the late 1970s. This did not last long. Shells, uh, you know, are fragile. There's not a lot of ways that you can sort of lacquerize and, and uh, protect that surface and make it, make it stronger. Um, but they tried. Uh, and she was attracted, though, to using the shells because new to, no two shells are alike. Um, and that, you know, again, we're sort of looking for a way of making a, a functional item um, really uh, uh, have a, a sort of new, breaking a new realm. Um, all different types of uh, diversity of materials, as we've said before, um, stones that included lapis, onyx, amethyst, uh, jade, rose quartz, agate, carnelian, um, reptile skins, alligator, lizard, Karung, other on animals included ostrich, calf skin, shark skin, just a, a, an entirely uh, uh, wide range of materials. Um, in addition, other, other types of uh, inspirations that she, she would go back to uh, included the art and decorative art world. Um, and this is based upon a, a painting by George Brock. Um, and uh, the, I, I think that, that for her, it started after seeing a Matisse exhibition in the 1970s, late 1970s, and that led her to create a number of floral designs, but then she began a series of envelopes that were directly related in some ways to, uh, to different artists. Uh, my personal favorite happens to be the Mondrian, uh, which is really quite wonderful. Um, she did this design for a couple of years in the early 90s, and um, she certainly was not the only one uh, who was, was fixated uh, on Mondrian in the fashion world. Uh, Yves Saint Laurent created a, a very famous cocktail dress, actually that was an homage to the artist in 1965. Uh, here we see a, a Bauhaus-inspired uh, uh, envelope. And um, really, you know, what, what I, I, I think you come away with in, in looking at, at her body of work is just the, the, the endless possibilities. And this is how it was often described when you were in a showroom and you encountered sort of all of the different types of objects that you could see that would that could become a, a Judith Lieber handbag. Everything from a Fabergé egg that you see at the top to um, a, a Tiffany-inspired uh, piece. Actually, you see several in this case. Um, but then I think there's also a, a really a wry marketing and a very whimsical sense that she has with a lot of her work. Um, for example, you know, a, a lot of her animal monodiers actually are finished all the way, and so if you turn them over, you'll actually see the padded feet of, uh, of the penguin or um, uh, the feet of the polar bear. Um, the 007 bag, which had its secret compartment uh, down below. You know, she was very keen and savvy on trying to pick up the zeitgeist and sort of produce bags that would have touches that tied in and make them very salable, making, make, make them connect with uh, people right from the start. Uh, and at the same time, she was also, again, still producing handbags that, um, you know, 
had a, a, a strong sort of fu functional purpose, um, and you know she was producing uh, like like this this briefcase for example, she, which she she made uh, at at the request of a New York businesswoman who was very prominent and successful and just basically wanted a feminized version of a New York business briefcase, which she did in 1987. Um, also, famously, every Lieber handbag was well accessorized or accessorized at least in the sort of uh, very specific sense of having uh, your, your small comb, mirror, change purse, um, Judith was fond of saying, uh, as long as there was enough room to carry um, lipstick, a credit card, and a $100 bill, what else, what other room did you need? Um, a lot of people might disagree with that, uh, but that was, that was one of the taglines. Um, naturally, what sort of kind of continuously brings the firm additional success and iconic status throughout the 1990s is its involvement with celebrities. And, um, you know, Beverly Sills was a very close friend of Judith Lieber's. Uh, they met at an opera in the early 1980s, um, and Beverly Sills already had several Lieber handbags, uh, and then Judith would en end up creating numerous other handbags for Beverly. Um, but Joan Rivers, Elizabeth Taylor, um, in 1996, when Christine Cavanaugh was uh, was the voice of Babe the Pig in the the uh, wonderful uh, 1996 movie, um, when she walked the red carpet with a Babe uh, a Pig Menadier, that really kind of captured a lot of attention, and and the red carpet has been Judith Lieber's ever since. Um, you have. Here, uh, a, a bag that was actually in the exhibition, um, a star-shaped piece that Sharon Stone carried in 1999. Uh, and Garrison, all the while, uh, as this is, is, is continuing, uh, was actually working this sort of world of fashion into his own art. And he did a whole fashion series in the 1980s and 90s. Um, many of these paintings actually would hang in a Judith Lieber showroom and would be sort of part of the, the background decor. Um, in one occasion, Judith actually created a handbag based on one of um, Garrison's fashion paintings in 1992. Um, again, in the exhibition, it was a challenge, but we, we tried to find ways that we could sort of connect these two worlds. And um, I think that this area did it uh, uh, somewhat successfully. We had a, a case with handbags that um, included some of the watermelon work that she did, including a, a, a small handbag with a brooch, a pillbox, watermelon menadier, but also a ladybug and, and tomato menadier. Um, in the backdrop, several of Garrison's paintings from the 1960s and 70s, and a small print of a watermelon too, just to sort of show that 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 continuing aesthetic connection that the two of them had. Um, so, as as time went by, and uh, the Liebers in the late 90s decided to sell their company, um, uh, they. Uh, uh, when they decided to leave the business in 1998, um, they were employing 200 workers. They were making $35 million annually in sales. And Judith ended up taking a position after the sale of the company in 1998 as president and CEO. Um, there were actually several other uh, transfers of company power between 98 and 2004. There have been several since then. Um, Judith's last design was actually this peacock-shaped Minaudier uh, from 2004. Its suggested retail price was $4,695. Um, the price range of Lieber handbags over the years went anywhere from $700 to $7,000. As those of you out there who are collectors might know, today online you can see a price range going anywhere from $200 to $2,000 or thereabouts. Uh, and 
if you go to the Lieber collection out in East Hampton, um, what you will find is more often than not um, bags that were done from the period of time in the late 1980s to, uh, to this point, uh, to this end of her career point. Um, meanwhile, Garrison has continued uh, now in his eighth decade as an artist. Um, he's continued to sort of experiment with different line and form. While Judith's last design was many years ago, um, she is, uh, the two of them are, are, are con continued to be extraordinarily close, sitting in a room with them. You ever, you, you know the experience of sitting in a room with two people that have that much love for one another and have had such amazing lives as that and you kind of feel elevated by the process, that really is what it feels like to spend any amount of time with them. Um, Garrison's compositions have become noticeably brighter over the last few years. They've become looser and maybe more abstract in certain ways. Uh, here he is um, out in that studio overlooking one of his gardens. He now actually uses milk crates as easels because they're easy to sort of compositely put together and pull out. Uh, and as I said before, last year alone, he finished more than 20 paintings. Um, he's still painting today. Um, this was a 60 inch by 70 inch work that he did in the spring of 2014. Uh, he did a whole series of um, works uh, often with very whimsical titles, such as this, Unfortunate Village Bereft of Mugu Gaipan. Um, uh, he had a whole series of, of works that he did based on Hampton Villages uh, in, from 2008 to 2010. And, um, you know, I, I, I just think that uh, it, was, it was a great project that I was, I was privileged to work on uh, and get a little bit of insight into, into this world, the, the world that the two of them have shared. Again, I would strongly encourage you all to, if you happen to find yourself out on the east end of Long Island to, uh, to seek this out. There are other great places to see out there, the Parish Museum of Art, uh, the Long House, also in East Hampton, which is a very unique garden combined with sculpture garden. Uh, but the Lieber collection is, is well worth visiting, and you will see and enjoy much of interest out there. And um, I, I need, of course, to also talk about the place that I am gainfully employed at. Um, I hope that you'll come to see us as well. We are worth a visit. Of course, I'm going to tell you that. We're off of uh, exit 62 of the Long Island Expressway on the north shore of Long Island, Stony Brook. We have one of the world's finest collection of horse-drawn carriages. We have um, Long Island art from all periods. Um, the large oil canvas that you see in the lower right-hand corner was uh, a Bill Durham work from the early 1980s, Black Opal. Uh, but the museum has outdoor gardens. We have outdoor sculpture. Uh, and we're continuously doing exhibitions of a wide variety. So. With that, I'd love, if there are any questions or comments or, or anything, I'd love to, love to field them, so. Sir. In a series, well, I, I, I wouldn't have the exact number, and I'm not sure that the Liebers would have the exact number. Um, what I do know is that, um, like I had, had explained at one point, she often would return to a specific Minaudier form, and she would do it again maybe several years later, anywhere from two to five to ten years or so. So uh, of, of the 3,500 designs, um, the breakdown in Minaudiers, I don't know. But I would say that that specific example of, of sort of something that would come up and would be repeated as a design, you're probably talking about somewhere in the realm of less than 100 total that, that sort of fall in that. In that. And, and, you know, clearly they were good sellers. Um, they were, uh, these were pieces that um, 
she could sh sort of re-envision with a new specific, w in a new specific way to meet, uh, you know, some of the, uh, a, a new set of socio-political circumstances. And so that's, that's when she tended to do it. But what she, really more often, she liked to sort of take a design that she had done before and sort of tweak it ever so slightly and make it slightly different. Um, so it's, it's, it'd be interesting to sort of, you know, try to get a census of that. Uh, and I think, I think they'll probably be able to do that in future years at, with the Libra collection uh, and also to, to some extent, the company archives that are still left. Yeah, there are a lot of copies, um, uh, but I, you know, and also I think uh, something that might be lost, or, or, or one thing that definitely is lost often, is is sort of um, the understanding of of Lieber designs over the last ten to eleven years. Um, versus designs that, that she was overseeing and directly involved in prior to 2004. That is usually never sort of in the tagline or in the description line when you're purchasing this material online. And the Liebers um, themselves have been trying to buy up as many examples as they can, but they've been doing it very carefully. They haven't sort of been out there, um, you know, repurchasing uh, every single example of everything that she did. Um, they've been sort of trying to, to buy things that, that fit the themes and fit the different eras of her career so that they can tell different stories at that collection. But I think your point actually about Budapest is well taken, and I think I think it's it is interesting to see sort of that um, as. There's a lot. Yeah, there is cert certainly a great deal of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I mean, it, it often would actually start with a f the sort of framing out of, of the piece. Um, uh, the, the, the work was, was initially would be done at the Lieber factory. Uh, and it, I think what, what, what their, their process of beginning to work with Italy um, over the course of the 60s and 70s, they weren't sending everything over for the finishing until really the early 1970s. And one of the precipitants of that was alligator, the alligator skin trade. Um, they, you know, they were, they were just, with alligators being endangered, with that sort of becoming less, uh, um, you know, having, having people with less ability to tan and work with that kind of skin specifically in the United States. Um, they had craftsmen and people in Italy that were, were, were working with a variety of different skins and they found that to be a better way. It certainly increased the price tag. Um, but you would start with sort of the basic framing out and construction of the bag in New York at the Lieber factory, and then the um, the sort of uh, the the work on the, uh, uh, both the the interior uh, la lining and also exterior uh, uh, skin or other work that uh, other type of material that was applied to it, it would be returned to New York for the finishing process for all of the whether it's a rhinestone encrusted bag or. Um, you know, just a sort of finishing work of the locks, the clasp, all of the hardware. All of that was, was done in New York as well. That was metal, yeah. That was, yeah, yeah. I mean, she worked, she, uh, naturally, she was working with a lot of, a lot of metal work as well. And um, so many, in fact, many of the Menadiers, actually, that's, that's sort of what's at their base, is, is metal work. Yeah. Yeah. How 
she really didn't do, I mean, at, at least according to what she told me and, and to what I've heard from other people, it wasn't really um, from sketchbooks very much. Um, she did occasionally produce sketches, but more often she was working directly with her hands in clay modeling and she or cardboard construction and she would create sort of a three-dimensional model of the item and then work with her designers on sort of taking that model and adapting it for the eventual mold um, but you know she was working she was actually sort of constructing a small sort of uh, three-dimensional version of the handbag from the very beginning and uh, it's, it's a really, really interesting thing to sort of think about that process. We have, uh, we're, we had in the exhibition a set of her tools in the front case, in one of the front cases of the exhibition, that show, sort of showed how complex that process was. They include every, all kinds of skiving knives uh, for leather work, but also um, uh, you know, compass and, and uh, calipers and uh, different types of scissors, depending on, on what she was working with. And there are not a lot of photographs that capture her sort of working in the studio, but uh, there are enough that, that indicate that, that she had that very sort of hands-on direct role in the handbag production well through the 1970s. And it was really only by the early 1980s that she began to sort of, um, you know, she's, she, she's very strong. Uh, she was a very strong manager and she, she felt sort of throughout this that, that she needed to be in, as involved in the process as possible, but she gradually uh, had a few people working directly with her and under her that she entrusted with um, doing some of that work throughout the 80s and 90s. Yeah. Well, well, if you if you mean in the beginning when she was working in 1963 when she started her company, uh, she had four other people who were working with her and they were doing some of the sewing. But yeah, she was working on every single aspect of it from the the er, preliminary design to its its finished. And that I think is is one of the things that makes her most unique because you know she wasn't just sort of envisioning this and drawing it up. She was actually making it yeah any any others okay thank you all so much thank you for having me